talk quickly about wilderness medical kits and medical kits, first aid kits in general. Most of the stuff that you can get that's commercially available, uh, a lot of times that is a, a 100 piece kit or a 200 piece kit. Well, the 100 piece kit is 99 band-aids and an alcohol wipe. The problem with that is, is nothing that a band-aid can fix was gonna kill you to begin with. So that's not really a first aid kit. That's kind of an owie's kit. Uh, and it's not really something that's important enough to carry, uh, in my mind at least. When you're putting together your kits, you need to start, just like any of your kits, uh, you need to start with the needs that you're trying to provide for first. And on the civilian side, when we look at medical and first aid, actual emergency type medical and first aid, they teach the ABCs, all right? Threats to the airway, threats to breathing, threats to circulation. On the TCCC side of things, the tactical combat casualty care side of things, we actually use the MARCH protocol, which is massive hemorrhage, airway, respirations, which is just another name for breathing, then circulation again, and then hypothermia slash prevention of shock. All right, those are things that are known threats to life uh, that we've learned on the battlefield and, and other places. Uh, so when you're putting together some type of kit like that, then keeping that MARCH protocol in mind is a great idea, uh, which is essentially not that much different than the ABCs, except it puts it in, I think, a little better priority because it doesn't really matter if you have an airway and you're able to oxygenate, oxygenate blood that's not there. Uh, so massive hemorrhage has to come first. Uh, so think about it along those lines. And for wilderness med, you know, technically what I'm trying to take care of with that is the five Bs, all right? Bleeding, breaks and sprains, burns, blisters, and bites and stings. Those are the things that I'm typically, those are the needs that I'm providing for when I'm out in the wilderness, especially with students, so I carry a more robust kit for that uh, than most people would have to, but I wanna show you what's in there. Uh, so aside from the regular first aid kits with the OWIE kits, we're not talking about that. It, it's difficult sometimes to find a commercially available medical kit that actually has things in it that you need, uh, but I think that the Adventure Medical Kits has done a good job. This is a good example of one. This is actually a guide kit uh, for the mountains. This is for seven people for 14 days. And it's broken down in such a way, let me move this to the side. It's broken down in such a way that it's already kind of prioritized so you can reach in and get exactly what you need rather quickly. And it's organized, all right? So depending on what you're working with, you know, you've got your stops bleeding fast, which is kind of your massive hemorrhage. Uh, you probably don't have anything in here for airways and for respirations or breathing. That's not typically something that we see in a wilderness type emergency, so that's not something that it's providing for. But you do have instruments. You've got things for breaks and sprains. You've got things for bleeding uh, and burns and blisters. So it's kind of broken down into a 5Bs kit already. So this is a good example of a kit that's broken down and it makes sense. It has things that you can do interventions on that are actually going to stop anything they're actually going to be useful for things that are going to hurt you out in the wilderness. So this is a great example of one of those kits. Uh, but if you don't have time to put together your own kit, this is a good way to go. Uh, and you don't necessarily need one that's quite this large. Um, but if you're a large family uh, that goes out in the wilderness together, then I recommend you get a uh, kit that's appropriately sized for your family and how long you plan on being out there. Uh, and it also has the owie kits and all that stuff in there too. So great kit to have for that. Uh, but when you start getting into, when you start getting into more purpose-built kits, um, let's talk quickly about the IFAC, the individual first aid kit. Now these are designed to have with you and yes, they're for self-aid, but they're also for buddy aid. You know, this is designed with the military in mind. So your, uh, or law enforcement actually has adopted it. So military or law enforcement, where you have a team or a partner that can use some of these things on you if you're no longer conscious. Uh, but there's also a lot of things in here you can use from the self-aid kind of perspective. Um, and this is kind of set up along the March protocol. Uh, and this is designed to be used on you um, but at the same time, you may be able to use this on some other folks as well, if you have it with you. With that said, you know, who should be carrying an IFAC? Well, if you carry a weapon for a living, you know, military or law enforcement, then of course you're always going to have your IFAC, and they always do. Uh, that's kind of one of those things. Uh, but 
Aside from that, let's think about who else could benefit from something that's set up to handle gunshot wounds, stab wounds. Um, so if you're a concealed carry permit holder and you carry a weapon for self-defense, then you should also expect that the reason you're carrying that is because you think there could be a possibility of a gunfight where you need that gun to defend yourself. If you know that, then you should also expect that the other person does have a gun and can inflict gunshot wounds on you, and you'll need to be able to handle that after you stop the threat. So, you know, kind of the saying goes, you know, everybody wants to conceal carry, but nobody wants to IFAC. Uh, at a minimum, you should always have a dedicated tourniquet, uh, but I recommend you carry a full IFAC if you conceal carry. Uh, as you grab your weapon, as you grab your, your uh, sidearm, your concealed carry for the day, you should also grab your IFAC and have that close by. If you don't want to carry this big one, at least have a tourniquet in your pocket at all times so you can stop the bleed long enough to get to your vehicle or wherever you're keeping your IFAC so you can handle that until emergency care gets there on the scene. Uh, a lot of times you don't have time, especially for a life-threatening bleed, you don't have time to wait for EMS. Um, the Stop the Bleed program has happened uh, recently and it's been a couple years, so it's more and more available. You have stop the bleed kits that are everywhere, but you should be your own stop the bleed kit. Right? You shouldn't rely on that being provided for you. You should have it with you, especially if you're concealed carry. Uh, so concealed carry would definitely benefit from the, uh, carrying an IFAC. Uh, who else would benefit? If you live in a populated area, uh, if you watch the news at any time, you know that terrorist attacks, uh, criminals and uh, active shooters, those are a real thing and they're happening more and more often, unfortunately. So being able, which is kind of going back to why they have the Stop the Bleed initiative. Uh, anybody that's in a populated area or an area that could be prone to that kind of thing should be carrying some way to stop a life-threatening bleed on yourself or your family if you should run into one of those situations, hopefully you never do. Uh, so. That's who could benefit from carrying one of these. And this is kind of your massive hemorrhage, your airway, uh, your respirations, your circulation, and your hypothermia prevention. Not so much in here, but that is what this is for. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Then going into the wilderness medical side of things, typically unless I'm a hunter, uh, then that goes back to this one, if you're a hunter, uh, you realize that you're out in the woods with people that maybe haven't used their firearms except for once a year. Uh, and they're not typically woodsmen, uh, at least not in the woods that I hunt in. There's a lot of folks that, that literally come out of the woodworks and they, they go out and they're lining the trees with orange vests and, and firearms and scope rifles and they don't really know how to use them. And if you've been to any range, you've probably seen some unsafe acts there as well to where you wish you had one of these if you didn't. Uh, so. Accidents happen, it's best to be prepared for those first. Uh, so that's who could benefit from this. And then for the wilderness side of things, really you're not typically seeing a lot of gunshot wounds and stab wounds. You know, what you're seeing is somebody that cuts themselves um, with an ax or a knife, or they have broken or sprained uh, one of their joints, uh, broken a leg, uh, broken an arm, something to that effect, uh, and then burns, especially minor burns from the campfire. That's something that you would see with that. Uh, blisters and uh, bites and stinks. Those are things that you kind of are packing this for. So understanding what you're trying to provide for, how many people you're trying to provide for, uh, and then also knowing how to use all that stuff is important when you're putting together your kit. So begin with what the needs are that you're trying to provide for in mind first, and then build your kit around that. That's the best bet, and it's going to be more tailored to your needs than a commercially available kit is going to be.